As we continue to put heat energy into an object or run electricity through it, we can convert these forms of energy into light. And some objects are more efficient for making light than others. For example, we wouldn't try and light our home with a beaker full of hot pins, nor would we try and heat our home with a series of fluorescent lights. As we study light, there's two main topics that we want to focus on. One is reflection with mirrors, and the other one is refraction with lenses and mirrors. Let's start by investigating reflection. With experience just using mirrors, your students should have a gut feeling about the famous mirror law, the law of reflection. The angle of incidence, the light rays coming in, equals the angle of reflection, the same angle of the light rays coming out. We want to test this by actually doing an experiment. To start with, you need a piece of paper for each group. On the paper, the students draw a straight line and then a perpendicular line down the middle. If you use graph paper, it makes it real easy to do. Then they mount a mirror on a piece of clay so that the center of the mirror is lined right up with the center line and the edges of the mirror are lined perfectly perpendicular to the center line. Then they'll make different angles of light rays coming in using pencils. We'll put one pencil coming in at this point. You want the pencil tip to point right into the center where the two lines intersect. If you look into the mirror, you'll see the reflection of this pencil going off in the other direction. They want to then line up their eye on the other side and with their second pencil, line it up perfectly so that that second angle that second pencil is lined up in a straight line with the first pencil. Then they want to go and mark it. Mark the points of the pencil, one and two. Remove the pencils. Then go on and remove the mirror. And with a straight edge, draw in the lines from the points to the center so that they get lines going in two directions. Once they've done this, they use a protractor and measure this angle coming in from the line coming in or the pencil coming in to the center line and see if that angle equals this angle over here. Record this information because we're going to try many different angles and it's up to the students. Have them try about three or four different angles, somewhere between here to here. And each time they do it, if they do it correctly and line it up good, they should find out that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Not only does light reflect, but it also refracts or bends. And as light goes from one substance into another, it slows down or speeds up depending on what substance it's traveling in. The fastest light travels is 186,000 miles per second, or three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's three with eight zeros on it. As it goes into glass, or even air, it slows down. The thicker the material, usually the slower it goes. The way to explain refraction to your students is to draw a picture on the board of a column of soldiers marching along hard terrain. As they continue to march, they come to a mud field. They're hitting the mud field at an angle, so the soldiers on one end hit the mud field first. They slow down. The other soldiers that are still walking on the hard terrain continue to move until they hit the mud field, and then they slow down. As a result of all this continuous slowing down, once they're in the mud field, they're now pointed in a different direction, and they'll be marching through the mud, and but making a bend now and going off in a new direction. Now if the soldier that went into the mud field first comes out first, then the column of soldiers will bend back and be marching in the same direction that it was before going into the mud. If, however, the angle is different when they come out, then we can even make them bend more and have the new line of soldiers marching off in an entirely different direction than they were when they went in. This is a good way to explain refraction because this is exactly what happens when a light beam goes through a prism or a lens and gets bent. We know that white light is made up of all the spectral colors mixed together. And when we project this white light into the side of a prism, we bend it. Some of the colors bend more than others. The violet bends the most and the red bends the least. 
And the shape of the prism is such that when the light comes out on the other end, it gets bent even further. So we have a greater distance between the violet and the red. If you understand how a prism works, you can also understand what forms rainbows. To see a rainbow, you always have to have the sun at your back, looking up into the sky of rain. And the beams from the sun hit the droplets of rain. They go through and refract and then reflect off the back side of the drop and then come back out, refract again, come down and hit our eye. The angle that it reflects at has to be 42 degrees from the sun to the raindrop and back to our eye or we won't see the rainbow. And this also explains why it's curved because those are the only droplets that will make that 42 degree angle off into our eyes. Let's go on and see how we can use a prism and observe this spectrum firsthand in the classroom by projecting the sun's image from outside into the room, and also how we can make our own prism. Every elementary student should see a prism in action. And if you only have one in your school, don't worry, because there's a way to project the spectrum into your room from outside. First darken the room, then put a large piece of white paper on one wall opposite the door. With the door open, have a student with a steady hand go outside and hold the prism just above his or her shoulder with the sun at their back. By carefully turning the prism just right, you can get to that position where the sun goes through the prism and projects the spectrum of colors in through the room about 25 feet away and onto the white paper. If you want your students to remember the names of the colors in order, what they must do is remember the name Roy G. Biv. This gives the seven colors of the rainbow. To further illustrate the operation of a prism, you can make your own, very simply, with a pan of water and a flat mirror. This pan is about two and a half inches deep and 12 inches long, and the flat mirror is sitting in the water at about a 45 degree angle, and it's taped across the top to prevent it from falling in. Darken your classroom once again, and this time we're using an artificial light source. Have the student shine the flashlight off one corner, very low to the water so the light refracts the most, and have the beam hit the mirror. The refracted light will come back through the water, refract again, and another student will hold a screen up over in this region and pick up the spectrum of colors. This incidentally works real good in direct sunlight. But remember, the sun has to be reasonably low in the sky, and you should caution your students about looking at that image of the sun as it's reflected off the mirror. Understanding the principles of refraction is very important in understanding the operation of lenses, which we're going to look at next. As we investigate how lenses operate, let's start by reviewing the basic properties of light. First, that light travels in straight lines, and this can be demonstrated with a pinhole camera. The easiest way to make one is use a coffee can and punch a tiny little hole right in the center of the bottom of the can. And then with the plastic lid, cut a big square in it for a screen and place a piece of wax paper around the other end and then cover it with your screen. There's two ways you can use this. One is to have the students go outside and hold this as an object and then they have to cover themselves with jackets or a blanket or something so it's dark inside, just like the old style cameras. Or you can darken your room and put a light bulb on in one spot of the room and they can come toward it and see the image of the light bulb on their screen. Whatever they're looking at, they'll see two things. First, that the image is inverted and second, that as they get closer to the object, the image gets bigger. Those are two good observations. Now, how does this work? Well, remember there's a very tiny hole here, so very few rays can come through from our object. Let's take, for example, a ray that comes off the top of the light bulb. If it goes right straight across, it hits the side of the can and doesn't go through. But if it's one that just happened to be going in a straight line down at an angle and hits that hole, then that image will continue through and come out on our screen. Remember that the top of the bulb is now on the bottom of the screen. Now let's think about what happens when a light ray comes from the bottom of the bulb. The only one, of course, that can get through is one that's going upward through the hole. So now the image of the bottom of the bulb is on the top of the screen. So we're going to see an image of the bulb, but it's going to be inverted upside down. Now why does it get larger as we move the camera closer to the object? 
Well, this is because the angle that the rays go through is greater as it goes down, so the image, of course, will have to be larger. Now let's make a guess at what we think would happen if we cut this hole larger, this little pinhole. Well, remember the ray from the top that got blocked. It's now going to get through. So we're going to have an image of the top of the bulb on the top of the screen, but we're also going to have that image of the top of the bulb on the bottom of the screen, too. So it's, we're going to get lots of different rays in different places on the screen. That will make a distorted image, and it won't work. The other property of light that we should review is refraction. Remember, light bending. And there's two important factors that determine how the light bends, or how much it bends. One is the density difference between the two materials. If we're going from air into water, or air into glass, we're going through a great density difference, so we're going to get a lot of refraction. The other factor to consider is the angle that the light is hitting at the intersection between the two materials. Remember the soldiers marching in the mud. If the angle's coming right straight down, and hitting this water, we're going to get no refraction. As the angle gets greater in this direction, we're going to increase the amount of refraction. You can demonstrate this in your classroom with your fish tank. Fill it with water, pour a little bit of milk in there to make it somewhat cloudy so the beams of light will show up, and put a mirror in one end. Just set it flat in the bottom. Now I'd like to close down the amount of light that's coming from the flashlight, so I'm going to use a piece of construction paper with a slit in it. I'm going to shine it through this side of the tank. When I'm shining it flat through this side of the glass, the beam almost goes right straight through because the angle's not very great. But as I lift the flashlight up, I'm not shining through the glass anymore, but I'm going into the water at a very steep angle. And we'll see that the refraction angle is greatly increased. And you get to move the angle back and forth as you move the flashlight up and down. Now you're ready to introduce lenses to your students. Start with your prism. Remind them what happens to the light rays when it comes through the prism. It's going to bend toward the thickest part of the prism. That's the base. So it's going to bend downward. If we have this prism upside down, a light ray coming through is going to bend toward the thickest part of the prism, the base, which is now pointed upward. So this ray will come upward. That's important they understand that because we're going to take two prisms and put one on top of the other. And think about what happens to the rays when they come through. Ray coming through the top will bend downward. Ray coming through the bottom will bend upward. Remember, the rays always bend toward the thickest part of the lens. We've now made a lens here. The rays will cross at a certain point out here. This is called the focus. The information on each light ray will stay identify with that ray. In other words, it'll continue through. All those light rays will cross at that one point and not lose their identity. And somewhere back behind here, we can put a screen and project the image of the object on the screen. This is a convex lens. The other type of lens is called a concave lens. Just like caves are hollow in the middle, so is a concave lens. It's now two prisms that are put together this way. We now have the thick part on the edges, on the top and the bottom. So the rays coming through here and the top part are going to bend upward. And the rays coming through the bottom are going to bend downward. This is called diverging rays. And they're not going to come to a focal point. And we've got interesting properties of both types of lenses. Let's now go to an activity that allows us to investigate the properties of convex and concave lenses. After you've introduced the two types of lenses, hand out a small magnifier to every two students. Have them decide whether their magnifier is a concave or convex lens. They can either feel it and feel that it's bowed out on both sides, or they can hold it up to a light source and focus the light onto an object and see that all the rays come together. Both of these suggest that it's a convex lens. Then have them experiment with it. Ask them what they can find out by using this lens. Give them a piece of newsprint to look at. They should come up with two main points. Number one is that when the object is close to the lens, it's right side up and it's larger. When the object is far away from the lens, the image is upside down and smaller. If you have concave lenses to experiment with, the students will find that the image is always smaller when they use a concave lens. 
Now back to the magnifier. There's two interesting activities. First, have the students face the window where there's some light and hold the magnifier toward the window and then put a piece of wax paper between the magnifier and their eyes. They'll see an image of the window projected on the wax paper. This is a result of those rays of light going through the focus and coming back out and projecting their image on the wax paper. Would you expect the image to be right side up or upside down? As you would guess, it's just like the pinhole camera where the pinhole is the focus point where all those rays go through and we get an upside down image. Another thing you can do is an experiment. Have the students measure the focal distance. Make it so that the, the light is all focused to one point and then have the lab partner record that distance in centimeters from the center of the lens to the surface of the object while the student's holding that pinpoint very, very small. What is the focal length of the lens? I wonder if they're all the same. Your students can go on and investigate other types of lenses using water drops. You need some water drop holders. They can be made out of pieces of wire. And this is copper wire. I've got three different sizes of water drop holders. One that's five millimeters across, one that's 10 millimeters across, and the third that's 15. The smallest one is the most versatile. You can dip it in a little cup of water and you'll get a water droplet to sit in it. If you hold it over newsprint, you see that the image is not only smaller, but right side up. This suggests that it's a concave lens. In fact, it is. If you get an eyedropper, you can carefully add a drop of water to the original drop, make more water, and make the lens bow outward and make a convex lens. Now when you test it this way, you see that the image is magnified. The students can have lots of fun experimenting with all these different size loops, seeing what type of lens they can make. And surprisingly enough, this large loop, 15 millimeters, can hold one water droplet. But it's so thin that there's very little curvature at all, therefore very little lens power. If you want to throw a curve into the experiment, put some dish detergent in the water. This reduces the surface tension, doesn't allow the water to bow up, so all the little magnifiers really are not magnifiers at all. This experiment should be done with a lab sheet with step-by-step -step instructions as to what the students should do next with each of their little water drop magnifiers. Now, mirrors also focus light, and there's two special kinds of mirrors that we can investigate, concave and convex mirrors. Have you ever looked at your image in a mirror and raised your right hand? The image raises their left hand. There's something backwards about mirrors. And if you can remember that fact, then you can remember the relationship between lenses and mirrors. The properties of the convex lens are the same as the properties of the concave mirror and vice versa. Let's look at the concave mirror. A shaving mirror is a good example. This mirror has the same properties of a convex lens. This means that if we're close to it, our image is magnified and right side up. And if we're far away from it, and in this case you have to be pretty far away, you see your image reduced and inverted. Also, the concave mirror should focus the rays of the light. It should diverge the rays. And we should be able to find the focal point just like we did on the lens. Another interesting thing about a concave mirror in a practical application, it's used in most reflectors of light bulbs like flashlights. The reason is, is that every beam of light will hit a side of this mirror and the angle is such from this one central focus point that all the beams will radiate outward in a straight line and will be able to direct the light from this little light source. Concave mirrors are also found in reflecting telescopes. These telescopes use mirrors to focus the light's rays and magnify the image. A refracting telescope uses lenses to produce the same effect. Now what about this convex mirror? These are commonly used as rear view mirrors in cars and you can find them in the automotive section of your store. The properties of the convex mirror are the same as the properties of a concave lens. Therefore, the image is going to be smaller and right side up when we use this type of mirror. Another idea to get across is that the curvature of the mirror is important for the particular properties of the mirror. This mirror would come off of a sphere, a giant circle, that's maybe about this big. 
Some mirrors are curved more as the circle would get smaller and have different properties than this one. Let's look at the spoon and make some guesses. What do we think our image would be when we looked on this side of the spoon as compared to what the image would be on this side? And if you're having difficulty seeing the magnified image on this side, it's because you have to get very, very close to the surface because of the curvature of the spoon. Now let's go on and do a very fun and challenging activity. I call it backward writing. First show the students how to make a secret message that can only be read with a mirror. Have them start by using a pencil and writing out the message that they want to convert. Then lay it face down on top of another sheet of paper and with their pencil rub out all the area where the words are. This will push the mirror image through on the second sheet of paper. You can then trace it with your pencil and make it darker and make the secret message that can only be read with a mirror. Another very challenging activity, and you'll even like this one, is trying to print your name while you look into a mirror. Get a mirror and set it perpendicular to a piece of paper, and then looking only in the mirror, try and print your name. It's a lot harder than it appears. There's two ways you can do it. Print it one way, so it reads your name correctly when you look at the piece of paper. And then print it another way, so it reads your name correctly when you look into the mirror. And on my two trials, this is as good as I could do. As we conclude this section on light, there's some other important concepts to consider. Remember that light is a very narrow band of radiant energy that we can see. On the violet side of light, we get into the, the energy of shorter wavelength, into X-rays. And down on the red side of light, beyond infrared, we start getting into microwaves. Your microwave oven uses them, and so does radar. And then down below that, we get to television and radio, the longer wavelengths of energy. The other topic to think about when you study light is that there's a difference between wavelength and intensity. You can have a very bright light, very intense light, and it can blind you. Those big searchlights at grand openings and lasers and looking directly at the sun can blind you. You should tell your students about safeguarding their vision. The other idea in light that we should finish with is that light does travel very, very fast. But even at those great speeds, it still takes time for it to go from one point to another. It takes eight minutes for light from when it leaves the sun until when it hits the earth. And light from the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, takes four years. This is what we call light years. And it's really a measurement of distance. It's the distance that light travels in one year. If you look at the constellation of Orion, the lower right star, Rigel, that star is 500 light years away. It's an interesting prospect because when you're outside at night looking at that star, the light you see is 500 years old.